Okay, guys, we're ready to begin the second of three lectures in chapter eight. The first lecture, um, Zoom lecture included section 8.1. Um, this one will be covering sections 8.2 and 8.3. And then the third Zoom lecture will be over sections 8.4 and 8.5. We will not be covering section 8.6. Okay, so in the previous lecture, we wrapped up talking about enzymes and um, basically discussed this particular uh, table. So that's again, kind of where we, we left off previously. So if you're looking, you know, where in the book uh, to go, you can easily find that. So section 8.2, the pursuit and utilization of energy. Um, when we talk about energy from a physics point of view, uh, or when you look at it defined in many science texts, as it says on the slide, it's often defined as the ability to do work or the capacity to do work or to cause some sort of a change. And there are all different kinds of energy. If you stop and think about it, we could talk about solar energy. We could talk about electrical energy that's powering our our uh, PC right now that we're using. Um, we could talk about um, uh, the energy found in Yellowstone National Park, those geysers, right, those mud pots. We could talk about the energy being emitted from those deep ocean vent communities that we talked about in one of the earlier chapters. Um, we could define atomic energy by looking at, um, you know, nuclear power plants and how they generate a heat that causes steam to form and the turbines to spin and so on and so forth. We're going to be focusing our attention in this chapter uh, on chemical energy and how cells basically extract energy in food molecules, which they in turn will use to make their own sources of energy. And we're talking here primarily about adenosine triphosphate or ATP, which I know you've all heard about back in a &P. As I said a few moments ago, we will not be covering section 8.6, which is on photosynthesis. We will not describe anything with regard to solar energy and how it's utilized by autotrophs, photoautotrophs. So an important uh, concept that we need to have some understanding of when it comes to how cells take energy from food and convert that into usable forms, i.e. the formation of ATP, um, involves this type of chemical uh, reaction. It's actually a pair of reactions referred to as reduction oxidation reactions. And I suspect some of you who perhaps have taken uh, allied health chemistry or introduction to chemistry or even college chemistry have heard of these redox reactions for short, reduction oxidation. These reduction oxidation reactions are taking place in all cells, eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And they all always occur in tandem. And it basically describes how electrons are shuttled about between molecules. And that shuttling of electrons is really important to understand because it forms the basis for how ADP becomes phosphorylated to make ATP. That's one of the most important concepts uh, with respect to how cells derive their energy. It's from the phosphorylation, the acquisition of a phosphate group onto ADP that results in the formation of ATP. And that process of phosphorylation of the ADP occurs ultimately as a result of thousands of reduction oxidation reactions that are taking place within the cell. In this slide at the bottom, we see the summary reaction of aerobic respiration. This you may recognize as glucose on the left-hand side, which says in the presence of six oxygen atoms yields six CO2 
six water and some energy. And again, a lot of that energy at the end that we're going to talk about is in the form of chemical energy that the cell can utilize. And so in this basic overall reaction, which really is just that, it is a summary reaction because there are literally dozens, perhaps even hundreds and hundreds of individual reactions at work um, as a cell goes to break down glucose in the presence of oxygen and producing CO2, water, and energy. But in essence, what's going on here is the hydrogen here in the glucose is the electron donor, which is ultimately going to make its way at the end of the electron transport system to help make water. And uh, along with the, uh, the hydrogens um, within which the electrons are being carried, oxygen becomes the acceptor of those electrons. It becomes reduced. So the acquisition of electrons is called reduction. The, the, re, the donation or the loss of electrons is called oxidation. So when that oxygen gains those electrons, it's going to combine with oxygen to make water. And again, we're going to see that in the electron transport system in a few minutes. So just have a concept of, of what reduction oxidation is. Again, reduction is the gaining of electrons. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. And so there's a constant give and take, a constant transfer from a donor to an acceptor of these electrons all throughout cellular respiration. And it, and it forms the basis for the ultimate production of energy for the cell. Now, We've talked a little bit earlier about several coenzymes, which remember are enzyme helpers. And we did list NAD and FAD uh, as examples of oxidized forms of coenzymes, which can be reduced, can gain electrons, and assist in the ultimate production of that ATP that we know a cell is going to want and need. So what you see on this um, slide on the right-hand side is a model, a two-dimensional model of a carrier molecule called NAD+. This superscript plus is simply indicating that there are more uh, positive charges in the form of protons in that molecule than there are electrons. And what this nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide molecule can do is it can gain electrons. And that's what's going on here at the bottom of the slide. Again, when you gain electrons, we say you have become reduced. What we've, what we've gotten here is a reduction oxidate, a, a reduction reaction, I should say. Here's our NAD+, which is the abbreviated form of this molecule, which is gaining now electrons. And again, most of the time, um, we, we talk about those electrons um, coming from other molecules, other sources, which we're going to again get into a little bit later. I'll call them food molecules. And there's also sometimes protons also acquired. So this H superscript plus, these two hydrogen ions are in essence protons because the hydrogen atom is really nothing more than an electron and a proton. And so let's think for simplicity's sake as NAD plus being a molecule that is an electron carrier. Even though it also carries protons, we're gonna think of it as an electron carrier. And in this particular instance, this NAD has acquired those electrons and has formed this molecule called NADH. This is the molecule that we can sometimes think of as the, uh, if we use the analogy of a school bus, for example. Here's the empty school bus. Here's the school bus, if you will, full of passengers in the form of electrons. That's the metaphor of the analogy that I use when I teach this in A&P 1. 
So this is a shuttle. This NAD plus is the empty shuttle bus, the empty school bus, which when it acquires passengers, if you will, in the form of electrons and some protons, becomes the full carrier, the full school bus, with the passengers again being electrons. Now there are other molecules at work here besides just NADH that are that are formed. We're going to talk about FADH. And if we were if we were talking about photosynthesis, we'd talk about NADPH, which we're not going to, but but these are examples that you see on the left-hand box of, of forms of coenzymes that have yet to gain their electrons, that have yet to gain their passengers, okay? But they can do so and will do so and play an important role in ultimately donating those electrons in a particular part of the process called the electron transport system, which will culminate in the formation of ATP or energy for the cell. Let's watch this summary reaction um, or series of reactions uh, shown in this video. Cells obtain energy during cellular respiration by oxidizing food molecules such as glucose. The energy derived from these oxidation reactions is used to form ATP. Oxidation can be defined as the removal of hydrogens from a molecule. Since a hydrogen consists of a proton and an electron, a proton and an electron are removed during oxidation. Whenever a molecule is oxidized, hydrogen's removed. Another molecule must be reduced, hydrogen's added to it. During an oxidation reduction reaction in the cell, an enzyme is involved in transferring the hydrogen, proton plus electron, to a coenzyme called NAD+. This enzyme has a binding site for both the substrate and NAD+. Once the substrate and NAD plus are bound with the enzyme, the hydrogen is transferred from the substrate to the NAD plus. In other words, the substrate is oxidized, loses the hydrogen, and the NAD plus is reduced to NADH. As with all enzyme-mediated reactions, once the reaction is complete, the products separate from the enzyme and the enzyme can be used again. NADH, a high-energy electron carrier, diffuses away and is available to donate the hydrogen to other molecules. Okay. Cells of... So, see if you can answer this question. If a molecule has been reduced during a chemical reaction, it has blank. What do you think? Lost oxygen, gained oxygen, lost electrons and hydrogens, or gained electrons and hydrogens. So this, this term reduction, when we see that word, we think of, oh, it's lost something, right? Well, in the case of chemistry, though, it's just the opposite. If it's been reduced, it has gained electrons and hydrogens. OK. Well, we've talked about this molecule called ATP before, right? Adenosine triphosphate. This is the energy uh, currency of the cell. This is the substance that cells make in order to do cellular work. That could be locomotion or motility if it's a flagellated bacterium, let's say. It could be used in the synthesis of bigger, more uh, complex molecules from smaller, simpler ones, right? We talked about that earlier, and anabolism. It could be involved in assisting the cell in cell division, or in the case of bacteria, binary fission. So without ATP, without energy, cells are really up the crypt. They would not survive for, for a very long period of time. Okay. I'm gonna just pause here for just a second. Okay, so just a quick review of uh, ATP and where it gets the name, adenosine triphosphate. Um, 
obviously here we see the uh, compound called adenine. You might recognize this as one of the nitrogenous bases um, found in nucleic acids. Ribose is a single uh, sugar, a ribose sugar, which again, you may recognize as part of the nucleotide uh, in RNA. It's, it's the sugar, the, D, the ribose sugar. And of course, attached to the ribose sugar here would be the three phosphate groups. We have one here, one here, and one here, triphosphate. Notice that the uh, squiggly pink uh, line here represents unstable bond. It's a covalent bond, but it's an unstable one. And I'm not going to get into why that's unstable, but it is with this one being more unstable actually than this guy. And so as you know, when ATP is degraded into ADP and phosphate, it is the release of this terminal phosphate group from ATP that releases energy to allow the cell again to divide, to, to move through its watery environment. If it's a, you know, a bacterium, let's say that's, that's flagellated. Um, cellular work, in other words, occurs. Uh, and, and we'll talk about why that is or how that happens a little bit later. But this is sort of, uh, can be thought of as a uh, molecule that yes, it's degraded into ADP and phosphate that allows for cellular work, but it's also recharged in the sense that it can acquire phosphate groups. And that's how we're going to be describing this cellular respiration process uh, coming up. It's, think of it as a battery. ATP is the charged battery. And when we start to, to use the charge in the battery, we're producing ADP and phosphate. And that's helping us you know, run our cell phone or run our computer or whatever the case may be. But eventually we've got to recharge that battery. And that's basically where the food that a, a cell would assimilate or, or utilize uh, provides that chemical energy to help recharge the ATP battery. So we often talk about the ATP cycle and how it's constantly being replenished, but it's also being used at the same time. Well, in fact, here is the uh, slide I was envisioning just a moment ago, the ATP cycle that should look familiar to you. I think I actually stole this from the ANP textbook. So here's our fully charged battery ATP, which as I said a moment ago, can be degraded into ADP, which we see here, adenosine diphosphate, that phosphate group that gets pulled off the end, the terminal phosphate group, will attach to other compounds and allow the cell to do all sorts of stuff. Okay, Divide, move, make bigger, more complex molecules from smaller, simpler ones. Everything that a cell needs to do to survive can only occur if it's generating energy, ATP, and then bringing that energy down for the work to occur. How do we recharge the battery? How do we look at the left-hand side of this cycle? Well, again, that's going to get at what we're going to discuss in just a few moments. This gets at respiratory mechanisms, cellular respiration, not breathing in and out or anything like that. It's called cellular respiration. And that can be either in the presence of oxygen or in the absence of oxygen. We'll talk more about what that exactly means in a few moments. And fermentation is another mechanism that some uh, cells will utilize to help recharge the ATP battery. So, you know, come back to this slide uh, once in a while and, and kind of try to get a sense of the broader picture of how energy is utilized and how it's also made by cells. Okay, we're gonna describe two different mechanisms. We're gonna list three, but we're gonna take some time in this next section to talk about two of the three, ways in which cells generate this ATP molecule. I've actually already mentioned one, but here's another mechanism it's referred to as substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation. So we're talking about how do we phosphorylate the ADP in order to make ATP? And so basically what we've got here is a substrate molecule, 
of some sort that is phosphorylated, which simply means a phosphate group is bonded to it. Okay, and you see the phosphate group listed here, obviously. What's going to happen is in the presence of an enzyme, that phosphate group is going to be transferred to the ADP. And when you transfer a phosphate group to ADP, as we saw in the previous slide on the ATP cycle, the cell makes this high energy ATP. The substrate molecule, now devoid of its phosphate group, is another end product of that reaction. But do keep in mind that this is enzymatically driven. So the source of the phosphate group is coming from a substrate. And we're making that ATP by pulling that phosphate off the substrate and adding it to our ADP. So there is some ATP synthesis in cells as a result of this process called substrate level phosphorylation, where the substrate provides the phosphate group. This second mechanism, however, is, is more important to a cell because it's here that most all cells, be they prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells, will generate the majority of their ATP or energy. It's referred to as oxidative phosphorylation, where we're talking about a lot of different reduction oxidation reactions taking place within the cell. So more on that coming up in just about 10 seconds. The third uh, mechanism that I am not gonna speak to because we're not going to include section 8.6 uh, in the course, is devoted to how autotrophic, photoautotrophic organisms uh, make their energy with the help of sunshine or sunlight. So again, we're not gonna talk about three, but I did wanna just mention it because again, phototrophs do utilize a, a different mechanism to help get a lot of ATP or make a lot of ATP. So you can not worry about three, but I wanted to list it as a mechanism. All right. So let's talk about how most cells are able to generate this ATP, either through substrate level or through um, oxidative phosphorylation. We're going to focus our attention and assume that we're describing or talking about chemoheterotrophic cells. Now we defined what that meant in the first lecture. So go back and review if you need to review what chemoheterotrophic organisms are. And we're going to assume that the primary food, if you will, molecule that the cell is going to utilize is glucose. The primary fuel that's gonna be burned or degraded to help make ATP is glucose. But understand that glucose is not the only fuel or food that a chemoheterotroph is going to use to help make ATP. It's just a, one of the most common molecules that are, are utilized by cells. But we know that cells can drive energy not strictly from this monosaccharide, but if you break down a polysaccharide into glucose, you're going to get energy. Cells can also break down proteins. Cells can also break down lipids. In fact, lipids contain twice as much stored energy as proteins or carbohydrates. So while we will use glucose as an example, a little bit later on in this section, or maybe in the next lecture, we're going to expand our thinking and, and, and remember that all organic molecules, when degraded catabolically, can ultimately be used in the formation of energy or ATP by a cell. But we will, in this example coming up, talk about glucose. So here are the three steps, the three pathways that are coupled together. Glycolysis is the first, followed by the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, followed by what's called the respiratory chain. This is the electron transport system. And it's here 
that that all important process called oxidative phosphorylation occurs. Remember, this is the primary location or mechanism, I guess is the better word to use, uh, where the cell is gonna generate a ton of ATP. Okay. Well, let's describe a couple different ways in which cells can do this. Converting glucose into CO2 and water and energy, actually. And the one that I think you're probably more familiar with is the aerobic cellular respiratory process. What makes aerobic respiration aerobic is the fact that when all is said and done, it is oxygen that is the final electron acceptor. So I want you to burn this into your brain. It might not make much sense to you now, but it will a little bit later. In, in aerobes that undergo aerobic respiration, in these cells, it is oxygen, We'll talk about what molecular means in just a few minutes, but oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And with that acceptance of uh, electrons, the oxygen actually combines with hydrogens to make water. So more on that a little bit later. You've also heard about anaerobic bacteria, right? A strict anaerobe or an obligate anaerobe cannot survive in the presence of oxygen, right? That's, by, that's what the definition means. And I want you to know that an anaerobe goes through those same three steps that an aerobe does, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, or citric acid cycle, and the electron transport system. But the key difference here is that it's not oxygen that is the final electron acceptor, not oxygen. It's another compound, which we'll talk about, or a series of compounds that could act as a substitute for oxygen in acquiring those electrons at the end of the process. And in the third lecture coming up, which we'll get into later, uh, fermentation, you've all heard of that. In fermentation, we are not talking about the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, nor will we talk about the respiratory chain or the electron transport system. We will only talk about the first important step here called glycolysis. And note that the final electron acceptor are specific types of organic compounds that we'll talk a little bit more about later on down the road. So you, you don't have any oxygen present. Fermentation does not work in the presence of oxygen. Here is a schematic of what uh, was just described in the previous slide. So we've got aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, and fermentation. So you can always come back to this slide if you want to compare and contrast the three mechanisms. And you'll notice again, as I said earlier, these first two are employing glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and electron transport. But in the case of aerobes, oxygen is the final electron acceptor, while in anaerobes, it's not oxygen, it's other compounds, typically they're ions that acquire these electrons at the end. And in the case of fermentation, we don't have a Krebs cycle, we don't have electron transport, and we have some sort of an organic compound that ultimately accepts those electrons. The other thing I want you to pay particularly close attention to is the theoretical ATP yield per original glucose. So remember, we're gonna be using glucose as an example of the fuel being burned by our cells, the food being degraded, the food molecule being degraded by our cells in, in this example. And so theoretically, note that aerobic respiration yields upwards of 38 ATPs, while fermentation can only yield a maximum of two ATPs per glucose, while air anaerobic respiration uh, is somewhere in between the two. So as it says here, it varies depending upon what microbe it is we're talking about. 
Okay, let's start off with aerobic respiration. This is what you're most familiar with if you think back to A&P. This is a reaction that you should have seen earlier in today's lecture. I used it when I was describing reduction and oxidation reactions. And so this is a summary reaction. It uh, is, is involving dozens and dozens and dozens, perhaps hundreds of individual reactions. And basically what it's saying is that glucose, when degraded in the presence of six oxygen molecules, will generate six carbon dioxide, six water, and a theoretical yield of upwards of 38 ATPs. That number is actually lower than that, and we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. So how does that happen? Well, we just saw earlier that it happens as a result of those three pathways, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport, with the primary difference again being that in this case, it's the oxygen that acts to accept the electrons at the very end of the process. That's what makes this aerobic. So let's get into each of these three steps, pathways, processes, whatever you want to call them. I'm not going to talk about them right here. I'm going to get into some details, but you can come back to the slide after I lecture on that, and then this will make a heck of a lot more sense to you. All right, so let's talk about glycolysis. The first step in this example of, aero of, of aerobic respiration. Note where this occurs in both eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. It's in the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm. And what's going on here in glycolysis? Well, if you look at the word glycolysis, lysis meaning to break down. Glyco refers to sugar, specifically glucose. So at the top of this slide, we see glucose, which you know, hopefully the, form, the formula, it's the chemical formula of glucose. C6H12O6, right? Now we're not looking at the hydrogens and the oxygens that we know are part of glucose. We're just looking at the six carbons, aren't we, in the, in the, at the top there. We also have to remember that glucose is a six-sided, sugar. It's called a hexose sugar. Again, go back in chapter two of your textbook and, and take a look at glucose. So that is the primary preferred shape that glucose tends to take on. It's called a ring, simple sugar. We're going to, for simplicity's sake, sort of unravel that ring. And we're looking here at the linear form of glucose with the six carbons lined up. But in actuality, they would fold it back upon themselves to make this six-sided hexose ring. And again, we're not worrying about the hydrogens. We're not worrying about the oxygens, even though we know they're there within those bonded to those six carbons. So you'll see, of course, that there are actually nine separate reactions in glycolysis. You do not need to know all nine different reactions. You don't need to know the names of all these intermediary molecules formed along the way. So we're not going to worry about that chemical end of things. What I want you to understand is basically what do I start with, what do I end with, and what is made along the way of those nine reactions. So let's talk about that. What do we start with? We start with glucose. What do we end with? Well, let's look at the bottom here of the slide we end with two molecules of pyruvic acid or pyruvate. Note, each has three carbons. That makes sense because how many carbons were in the original glucose? Six, right? So we haven't lost any carbons, have we? And attached to these six carbons, three in each pyruvic acid, would be some oxygen and some hydrogens as well. Just like I said earlier, in the glucose, we're looking at just the bare bone skeleton of the glucose, right? The six carbons. The same applies 
when it comes to these pyruvic acid molecules. We're looking at the bare bone skeleton of the molecule. It's a three carbon compound, but there's also hydrogens and oxygen in there as well. Okay, so we've established the fact we start with glucose, we end with two three carbon pyruvate, pyru pyruvate or pyruvic acid molecules. What is made along the way? Well, look what happens here in the very first reaction. ATP is degraded into ADP. Now you might be wondering, well, why are we talking about ATP being degraded when I thought the whole, the whole purpose of this discussion is to talk about how cells make ATP? Well, we're going to make a lot of ATP in a little while, but I'm here to tell you that in order to get the ball rolling, if you will, the very first reaction of glycolysis involves the degradation of an ATP molecule. And you'll notice what happens to that glucose. It becomes phosphorylated. It acquires a phosphate group. Where did that phosphate group come from? It came from the ATP, right? Here's the ADP that's also produced. And so this first compound, whose name you don't need to know, but I'll just tell you what it is, right? It says glucose 6-phosphate. It's simply saying that we have a phosphate attached to the glucose, and therefore it's a different compound. In the third reaction, another ATP is degraded. We add another phosphate group onto the molecule, forming what's called fructose 1,6-diphosphate. Again, don't worry about the name. Just notice now we've got a compound with two phosphates. We still have the six original carbons <clears throat> that came from the glucose. And then in the next reaction, we're splitting this six carbon compound into two three carbon compounds. And then in the fifth reaction, What's going on? Well, we've got NAD plus, two of them here, that are going to start to pick up some electrons. Remember we said earlier that NAD, nic nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, was the empty school bus. And look what's happening to our two school buses. They are acquiring passengers in the form of electrons to form NADH, two of them. Now, where did those electrons come from that boarded NAD plus to form NADH? The electrons came from these two three carbon compounds. They didn't come from outer space, they came from the substrates. And by the way, each one of these blue arrows that you're seeing here, these represent enzyma enzymatic reactions, okay? Every one of these uh, reactions is occurring as a result of a specific enzyme assisting in that process of converting the substrate into a product, which becomes the substrate for the next conversion, right? Into a different product and so on and so forth. So this gets back to the pathway idea and how many enzymes are working, you know, in a particular manner to allow us to go through these uh, nine reactions. So we picked up some NADH, some electron carrier coenzymes. Notice what it says, two electron transport. So these guys are going to head to the last of the three pathways here. Remember, the first pathway is glycolysis, the second is citric acid, and the third is electron transport. All right, in the sixth reaction, we have something called substrate level phosphorylation taking place. Well, you, you saw a video on that not too long ago. I showed that. It was one of the three mechanisms by which cells make ATP, right? So go back and watch that again if you want. What's going on here is ADP is being phosphorylated. It's acquiring a phosphate group from the molecules here. And when we pull a phosphate group off of each of these and we slap it onto ADP, what are we gonna make? We're gonna make ATP, aren't we? We're making two of them here via substrate level phosphorylation. Now remember, back up in the first and third reaction, we broke down two ATPs. Well, now we have produced two ATPs. So we are not in the hole anymore. We've broken even, haven't we? We're down two here. We now add two, we're at a net of zero. But look what happens here toward the very end of glycolysis, just before pyruvic acids are produced. 
there's another series of substrate level phosphorylation reactions whereby an additional two ADPs become phosphorylated to make two ATPs. So in summary, in glycolysis, in this aerobic cell, glucose is degraded into two pyruvic acid molecules. The cell also generates two NADH coenzymes and also comes out ahead plus two ATPs via substrate level phosphorylation. Okay. Let's talk about what happens to the two pyruvic acid molecules we know are produced at the end of glycolysis. One possibility that we're gonna get into in just a few moments is how that pyruvic acid then enters into the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And that's the case for most all aerobic cells. Another possibility that we'll talk more about in the next lecture is how that pyruvic acid could be utilized in fermentation to make a variety of end products. And you might remember earlier that the final electron acceptor is not oxygen like it is in aerobic respiration, but rather is some type of organic molecule when all is said and done. I'd like you to begin to associate the formation of acids and gas and other compounds when it comes to fermentation products that, that cells sometimes make. We're gonna talk more about fermentation coming up in the next lecture, but just understand that the pyruvic acid produced in glycolysis could make its way into a number of different fermentation reactions. And then the third possibility for pyruvic acid would be not to see its continued degradation chemically, but rather in an anabolic series of, of uh, pathways or chemical reactions, that pyruvic acid could be used by the cell to actually form a variety of other organic compounds like amino acids, which could be put together to make what? Proteins, right? Or this pyruvic acid could be the building block of what eventually become sugars that the cell makes. Or as we see here, pyruvic acid can also be utilized by cells to make a number of different fats as well. Now, again, this is anabolic, remember? That is the process of taking smaller, simpler molecules and putting them together chemically to make bigger, more complex ones. So it depends upon what the needs of the cell are at any given time as to whether it's converted into other molecules that are used anabolically or whether it's used to continue on into cellular respiratory mechanisms. This could be actually aerobic or anaerobic or whether it's used by certain fermenters to make desired end products. We're going to assume in this next slide that the pyruvic acid is gonna continue on now and enter what's called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. Let's begin by talking about where this occurs in cells. Important distinction here, extremely important distinction. And that's to note the box on the left-hand side of the slide. If we were talking about eukaryotic cells, this process, Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, occurs in the center of the mitochondrion, which is the powerhouse organelle. You, you learned that many times. However, you know that prokaryotes don't have mitochondria. So we're gonna stay in the cytoplasm for the Krebs cycle. We were there in glycolysis, we're gonna stay there if we are a prokaryotic cell and, and see this series of reactions take place. Okay, so what's going on in the Krebs cycle? By the way, this term Krebs cycle is named after um, 
Hans Krebs, who won a Nobel Prize for uh, coming up with the, with the uh, proper chemistry to describe this cycle. Um, back in like 1905 or 1906, I think. It also goes by the name citric acid cycle because citric acid or citrate, which you see me circling here with my arrow, is the first compound produced in this eight reaction pathway. So if you're, if you're wondering where does citric acid come from, that's where it comes from. It comes from the first molecule made. Citrate is the same thing as citric acid. All right, so we produced two pyruvic acids, remember, in glycolysis. And so at the very top of the slide, you see that. Those two pyruvic acids, each made up of three carbons, are now going to be chemically converted into a two carbon compound called acetyl coenzyme A. This CoA, Co means coenzyme. But notice it has two carbons as evidenced by the, the orange highlight. So when we go from a three to a two, what happens to the other carbon that we've pulled off of the pyruvic acid? Well, you can see where it goes. It goes into the formation of carbon dioxide, which you hopefully remember is one of the end products of cellular respiration. What else is made during this particular conversion reaction from pyruvic acid to acetyl coenzyme A? Well, we've got NAD plus becoming NADH, and these are representing some protons. We have taken an empty school bus and we filled it with more passengers in the form of electrons, right? Just like we did back in glycolysis. And where's that NADH bus going that we've just loaded with electrons? Well, it's going to the electron transport system, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. So this acetyl coenzyme A, this two carbon compound produced, now can begin to enter the Krebs cycle. So this initial reaction up here, which we're calling you know, letter A, it is really a reaction that links glycolysis with the citric acid or Krebs cycle. It links the two. It's not part of it, but it, it, it connects them. So this two carbon molecule then loses its coenzyme, okay? So that's what's going on here. The coenzyme gets stripped off of the acetyl-CoA. And this two carbon compound then will combine with a four carbon compound that you see here that was made at the end of the previous series of reactions of the Krebs cycle. And when you add a four carbon compound to a two carbon compound, you make a six carbon compound. And that's the citric acid or citrate that I was referring to about 10 minutes ago or so. This is the first compound made in the process. Okay, what happens within the, the Krebs cycle? Well, we've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different reactions taking place here as we round the bend and come back up to the top. We start with a six carbon compound, we end with a four carbon compound. The names again, not important. What happens to the other two carbons? We have six, we end with four. We gotta be able to account for the two carbons. Well, look, look somewhere in that series of reactions and you'll see one of the carbons gets pulled off and forms CO2, there it is. So we go from a six to a five. And then we go from a five to a four carbon compound. There's the other CO2 that gets pulled off. In addition to forming some CO2 here, what else is going on? What else is the cell making in reaction three and reaction four? Well, NAD plus becomes NADH. NAD plus becomes NADH. And even here at the very last step, NAD plus becomes NADH. So in addition to the first school bus, if you will, that we made here in this sort of linking reaction, 
we're also producing three additional NADHs within the actual Krebs cycle. All of these NADH molecules, these electron carriers, are going to carry those electrons to our last pathway called electron transport. I want you to also note here at the very uh, bottom of this cycle in reaction number five, the cell is making an ATP molecule. This is a result of substrate level phosphorylation. So here's one ATP is also made in the Krebs cycle per revolution. And then I want you to look here also in step number six, where we have FAD becoming FADH2. Okay, you might remember seeing FAD plus listed earlier, along with NAD plus and NADP plus. These are the oxidized forms of the coenzymes. FAD is going to do a similar thing that NAD plus did, and that is take on electrons. It's just taking on not as many electrons as NAD can. So I'd like you to think of FADH2 as a smaller school bus. Okay, so the NADHs are the big, the big ones that we've all written in. And the FADH2, let's think of that as the smaller uh, yellow school bus that can hold maybe half as many passengers, if you will, in the form of electrons. However, it, like the NADHs, as we see here, are all caravanning to the electron transport system, where they're going to use those electrons that they've been gathering up along the way, and the cell is going to make a lot of energy. OK, the other thing that I want to say about this slide before we move on to the electron transport system is we've just described what is formed for each pyruvic acid that enters the Krebs cycle which in summary is one, two, three, four NADHs, one ATP, one FADH2, and two CO2s made here. But if we include the one up here, which we should, we'll call it three. How many times do we need to go through the link, linking reaction and the Krebs cycle per original glucose? What do you think? Well, if you said twice, you're right. Why twice? Well, because in glycolysis, the original glucose yielded two pyruvic acids, right? Each of those two pyruvic acids needs to go through first the linking reaction and then the eight reactions of the Krebs cycle. So if I'm interested in getting an idea of how many NADHs are being formed here per original glucose, I've got to go through this whole process two times. So the total number of NADHs is not one, two, three, four, it's really eight. And the number of FADH2s is not one, it's really two per glucose. And the number of ATPs formed here is not one, but it's two. And the number of CO2s produced is not just three, it's actually six. And now if we go back to that summary reaction, we can see the six CO2s that are made. We now understand that they're produced here, most of them in the Krebs cycle, but there are a few produced in this so-called linking reaction too. Okay, so the next topic we wanna to talk about is the electron transport chain or system and also oxidative phosphorylation. We now have to process those electrons and those hydrogen ions that we have pulled off of substrate molecules, 
and added to these electron carriers. And we will call upon a whole bunch of reduction oxidation reactions as we describe what happens to those electrons, especially that culminates in the formation of a lot of ATP. So again, I'm not going to really comment on the last uh, bullet here on this slide. I think after I talk about this, you can come back to this sort of summary slide and this will make more sense to you. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna play this video. We might actually watch it more than once and then we'll talk about it in some detail. So I'd like you just to sit back, try to absorb as much as you can from the video, understanding that it's not gonna all make sense initially, um, but you can watch this as many times as you want, but it does a very nice job summarizing what happens during the electron transport mechanism and how ATP is made via oxidative phosphorylation. I wanna draw your attention also to the fact that we're looking here, of course, at the mitochondrion, so we are talking about this happening in a eukaryotic cell, but this very same process occurs in prokaryotes, but just not in the mitochondrion, okay? So let's just watch the video. When glucose is oxidized during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, the coenzymes NAD plus and FAD are reduced to NADH plus H plus and FADH2. In the mitochondria, the electrons from NADH plus H plus are transferred to the electron carrier proteins and the protons are transferred across the membrane. As the electrons move from cytochrome to cytochrome down the electron transport chain, more protons are carried across the membrane. Cytochrome C transfers electrons to the cytochrome C oxidase complex. Protons are also transferred to the outside of the membrane by the cytochrome C oxidase complex. The cytochrome oxidase complex then transfers electrons from cytochrome C to oxygen, the terminal electron acceptor, and water is formed as the product. The transfer of protons generates a proton motive force across the membrane of the mitochondrion. Since membranes are impermeable to ions, the protons that re-enter the matrix pass through special proton channel proteins called ATP synthase. The energy derived from the movement of these protons is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and phosphate. Formation of ATP by this mechanism is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, that covered a lot of information. And as I said, um, you might need to go back and watch that two or three times. But let's see if we can kind of talk about what's happening. I'll, I'll sort of describe what happens and then you go back and watch that video again. And I think it will make more sense. In essence, here's where we are in the mitochondrion. Again, this is in eukaryotic cells. The same process occurs in prokaryotes, and I'll tell you where that happens a little bit later, but just try to follow what's happening here. So in the mitochondrion, you remember, I hope from a &P or biology, that you have in the mitochondrion an outer membrane shown here in brown, or here you can see it also. And you also have an inner mitochondrial membrane to form structures called cristae. And it's highly invaginated. Why is it highly invaginated? Because you can have more surface area if you have that particular shape than if it were, say, smooth like the outer membrane is. So having a very invaginated inner mitochondrial membrane means you have more surface area, which means more electron transport can happen. Let's take one of those cristae here and let's blow it up. Okay, and that's what we've got here. So to orient yourself, outer mitochondrial membrane in brown, inner, mito inner mitochondrial membrane in blue, in the very core of the mitochondrion, 
shown here in yellow, is the matrix region. And between the inner and outer mitochondrial membranes is the intermembrane space. Inter means between. So this space is between the inner and outer mitochondrial membrane. So you have to get an understanding of the anatomy here, this, if you will, the uh, structures that are present. Okay. Let's talk next about those bus loads of electrons that we have been gathering along the way of glycolysis, as well as that linking reaction and the Krebs cycle. We've been gathering a lot of NADHs, haven't we? Those are the big school buses, right? We've also been talking about how a few smaller school buses of electrons are also formed, FADH2. These are formed exclusively in the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. And there aren't nearly as many of these made as there are NADHs. When these electron carriers get to in this case, the inner mitochondrial membrane, because they're formed in the matrix, they're going to undergo oxidation. What does that mean? Oxidation is the loss of electrons. And when NADH loses electrons, those electrons are going to be given to special embedded proteins in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So you see here this, this protein called N. N is going to get the electrons coming from NADH. And this guy called F, protein F, is going to be the first to acquire the electrons that are going to be given off by FADH2. So just follow the arrows. Now, when NADH and FADH2 give off their electrons, give away their electrons, we say they have become oxidized. So here is NAD, it's really, it should be a plus here, NAD plus, and FAD plus. These are the oxidized forms of the molecule. They're the empty school buses. And they can go back into the system and pick up more passengers in the form of electrons and bring them back here to the electron transport system. And that's what they do. NAD plus and FAD plus are shuttles. They're either empty or they're full school buses and they shuttle back and forth. They pick up passengers and they bring the electrons here. They get those electrons in glycolysis. They get those electrons in the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. Okay, so we've already established now the role of these two important electron carriers. The next thing we want to talk about is what happens to all these electrons that have been gathered along the way that came from all these different substrate molecules that have been made from the time glucose was, was, was present to the time we formed you know, the pyruvic acids and eventually went into the citric acid cycle. Those electrons came from all those molecules. Those electrons get passed from protein to protein to protein to protein within the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is where a lot of reduction oxidation reactions take place. Okay, remember, reduction is defined as the acquisition or gain of electrons. Oxidation is the loss or donation of electrons. So we just talked about how proteins N and F acquired electrons. They became reduced thanks to NADH and FADH2. But we'll look what they're going to do next. They're going to undergo oxidation by, by transferring those electrons to another different protein, which becomes reduced. It, in turn, becomes oxidized as it transfers those electrons to another protein, which becomes reduced. So all of these proteins here, all of these blue and purple and orange and green and pink and red proteins, they undergo oxidation reduction ox, uh, reactions. They acquire electrons only to pass them on to the neighbor proteins. 
So again, tons of redox reactions taking place. Now, as those electrons are getting passed from protein to protein to protein to protein, in our example of the inner mitochondrial membrane, that process causes hydrogen ions to move from the matrix through the inner mitochondrial membrane and into the intermembrane space. So these pink larger arrows are showing the movement of hydrogen ions, which are basically protons, into the intermembrane space from the matrix. What powers their movement across is the reduction oxidation reactions that we just talked about that are taking place within these proteins. And we'll talk about the fate of these protons in just a moment, but I wanna go back and talk about the electrons here that have been passed from protein to protein to protein, the, from the blue to the purple, or not so much the blue to purple, from the blue to the orange, or purple to the orange, and then from there, orange to green, green to pink, pink to red. This last protein is this protein here called, um, no, actually it's not called that. This is called cytochrome C. And when cytochrome C acquires these electrons, what it does is it dumps them into the matrix, as you can see here, where they will combine with molecular oxygen. Okay, you heard me use that term about an hour ago or 45 minutes ago, molecular oxygen. I said, we'll talk about what that means a little bit later. But it's, it's not, and it's hard to describe, it's not O2, it's half an O2. It's an O, it's molecular oxygen, it's called. And when, when enough of those combine with enough electrons and some hydrogen ions in the form of protons, look what the cell produces here, water, water. So we're talking about aerobic cellular respiration, which by definition involves the oxygen acting as the final electron acceptor, and in so doing, uh, produces water. Okay. Back to our hydrogen ions that we have started to accumulate here in the intermembrane space. How do we get rid of those guys? How do they come back into the matrix? Because they would love to diffuse back in, right? Diffusion, the movement of materials from high to low concentration. They can. They can move back into the matrix if they pass through a special membrane protein, and that was the one that I was referring to a little bit earlier, called ATP synthase. Look at that word, what is that? It's an enzyme, right, AASE means enzyme. So this brown, funny looking structure is an embedded big protein, which is going to synthesize ATP. Just like the word says, synth, synth means to synthesize, to make. And so as those hydrogen ions, those protons diffuse back into the core of the mitochondrion, back into the matrix, we have a process called oxidative phosphorylation take place where ADP is phosphorylated to make high energy ATP molecules. And the cell makes a lot of ATPs this way. Okay. So I'd like you to go back now, watch that video again, and I think it's going to make a little bit more sense, I hope. Okay. Now we talked just a moment ago about how the shuttling of these electrons from protein to protein to protein within the inner mitochondrial membrane was the force that allowed for the pumping of these hydrogen ions into the intramembrane space. And that's referred to as a proton motive force that pushes those hydrogen ions into the intramembrane space. And as we said then occurs, they will diffuse back in 
by passing through that special large brown protein called ATP synthase. Let's watch a short little video that talks about this proton motive force. How do those hydrogen ions get pumped into the intramembrane space from the center of the mitochondria? Proton pumps are protein complexes that move the protons generated during oxidation reactions across the cell membrane. As the protons move through the proton pump, they begin to build up on the outside of the membrane. The protons accumulate on the outside of the membrane, creating a concentration gradient. The membrane is not permeable to the charged hydrogen ions, and they cannot diffuse back across the membrane. Instead, they must pass through a special channel. The protons move through this special channel, which is the enzyme, ATP synthase. This enzyme uses the energy derived from the movement of these protons to convert ADP into ATP. The movement of protons down a concentration gradient provides the energy for ATP synthase to form ATP. This mechanism of producing ATP is called chemiosmosis. It's also called oxidative phosphorylation. It's really the same thing. Okay. Now, we have been talking about this, me pumps. this mechanism taking place within eukaryotic cells within the mitochondria, right? But we know, as I said earlier, that prokaryotic cells don't have many of the organelles that eukaryotes have. In fact, the only one that they share in, in common is the ribosome. So if indeed the citric acid cycle, which occurs in the mitochondrion, and electron transport, which occurs in the mitochondrion, uh, take place, in prokaryotes, and there's no mitochondria, where does that happen? Well, in the case of prokaryotes, as we've said earlier, the first of the three steps or stages or phases or mechanisms, glycolysis and Krebs cycle, are occurring in the cytoplasm. Where does electron transport happen, you ask? Well, where would we have another membrane? Well, if you think back, to the prokaryotic anatomy chapter. We talked about paraplasmic spaces. Remember that? In both gram-positive and gram-negative cells, right? So let's look now at a cell, which we have on the left, a bacterium, with its large chromosome here in the center that has in this particular example, an outer cell wall, a, an inner cell membrane or plasma membrane, and between the two, sandwiched between the two, is this paraplasmic space. Now, these various colored proteins should look familiar to you. We saw those just a moment ago in our video and in the previous slide that we spent some time describing, talking about. We also talked about our big brown odd shaped protein. This is ATP synthase, remember? So in the same way that we talked about the movement of, of hydrogen ions, let me go back to that slide, from the matrix of the mitochondrion into the intermembrane space, right? And then those hydrogen ions made their way back into the matrix from the intermembrane space. Here we've got that same mechanism taking place here, only now we're pumping those hydrogen ions initially from the cytoplasm into the paraplasmic space, right? And they eventually can move back into the cytoplasm by passing through the ATP synthase enzyme, which is a protein. And that is what allows for the phosphorylation of the ADP into ATP. Okay, so now you know where this mechanism, electron transport, 
an oxidative phosphorylation where that occurs in the prokaryotic cell, if it's an aerobe. Okay, so this simply reviews the fact that by definition, aerobic respiration is called aerobic because molecular oxygen, shown here, the one half O2, is the ultimate final electron acceptor. The end result is the formation of water, right? In addition, of course, to ATP. You know, that's also made along the way as well. Okay, the formation of that water occurs in that enzyme or that protein called cytochrome oxidase. And again, I'm sorry to have to be bouncing back and forth all over the place, but that's this last protein in the, in the process, in the pathway. This is cytochrome oxidase, the last one. So you can see the, the yellow dotted arrows are representing the electron flow. So this is the last protein right here where the molecular oxygen combines with the electrons and some hydrogen ions to make water. Okay. Now I bring this to your attention, this, this name, the cytochrome oxidase protein, which again is the very end of, um, of the electron flow. Because when you get to your unknown in a couple of weeks, actually you're gonna be getting it very soon in lab, and you do this battery of tests on your unknown, one test you're gonna be performing is called the oxidase test. So we're going to determine whether your bacterium possesses this enzyme. Because some bacteria don't have this cytochrome oxidase. They have other compounds that are, that are used uh, as the final uh, you know, location for the production of that molecular um, or for that water production, I should say. So you're gonna be hearing about cytochrome oxidase coming up in another month or so. All right, so here we are summarizing glycolysis, that transition step, and then here's, of course, citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, and finally, um, electron transport. This does a nice job pointing out the uh, amount of different uh, outputs of compounds along the way. But I do want you to understand that while we may be able to calculate a theoretical yield of 38 ATPs per original glucose, the number is actually somewhat less than that. And that's what is described here in this part of the slide. Ordinarily, the amount of ATP derived from the electrons given off from one NADH is a little under three. It's about two and a half. And the amount of ATP yielded from the electrons that get pulled off of FADH2 is a little less than two ATPs per FADH2. It's about one and three quarters. So if we, if we change the, the ratio of three to one, three ATPs per one NADH to two and a half to one, and if we change this from two to 1.75 per FADH2, this number goes from 38 down to 32 ATPs per glucose. And then what we would have to do is also, also taking into account the fact that active transport, which you remember is the movement of materials against the concentration gradient, that costs energy for a cell. So that ends up lowering the overall benefit, if you will, from 32 ATPs per, glu per glucose down to about 30 ATPs per glucose, which is still significant. Okay. Um, and then as it mentions here in green, in a lot of prokaryotic cells, um, because they, they don't have maybe as many carrier proteins as we've described, it may result in a little bit more of a reduction in the amount of ATPs produced per FADH2. So it actually may be somewhat below two and a half. The point I'm trying to make here is that aerobic respiration, can yield, we'll just say, approximately 30 ATPs per glucose. That is pretty significant number of cell of, uh, of energy molecules, ATP molecules, as you'll see when we get into the third uh, lecture coming up soon. In, in a fermentation reaction, the maximum yield of ATPs per glucose is only two. And we're talking you know, something about 
uh, 15 times the output if we're talking aerobic, where oxygen is the final electron acceptor. Okay, another quick quiz question. What part of aerobic respiration releases carbon dioxide? Is it glycolysis? Is it the citric acid cycle? Is it electron transport? Or is it chemiosmosis, which is part of electron transport? Well, if you said Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, you were right. Okay, you remember earlier, I also showed you a box that described anaerobic respiration. And I told you at that time that unlike aerobic respiration, that involved molecular oxygen being the final electron acceptor, in an anaerobic respiratory situation, we go through glycolysis, we go through Krebs cycle or citric acid, we go through electron transport. Only here, instead of oxygen, it is some other compound, we'll call it a non-oxygen electron acceptor. And we'll, we'll give some examples in a few moments about um, different ions, this is sulfate and nit nitrate. It's, it's something other than oxygen. Let's just think of it in that way. That becomes the final electron acceptor. And so in the case of some anaerobes, it could be carbon dioxide that becomes the final electron acceptor. And in that instance, CO2 is converted into methane. Now we talked about methanogens in one of the earlier PowerPoints. These are cells that make methane gas. And they do so anaerobically, again, using their CO2 to gather those electrons at the very end. And that chemically converts the CO2 into methane. Certain kinds of bacteria called sulfate bacteria are going to reduce SO4, this should actually actually be a two with a minus charge like this guy here. Um, not important to really know that other than to understand that that SO4, that non-oxygen molecule can be converted into hydrogen sulfide gas, which is the rotten egg smell. You've all smelled that perhaps. If you go to a marsh or a swamp and you go out, uh, you know, exploring the swamp and you get that mucky black goo on your boots. Sometimes when you pull that boo out of the out of the muck, you smell that rotten egg odor, right? Well, that's hydrogen sulfide. That's being produced by, by uh, anaerobic bacteria that live uh, in the muck under the water in the swamp. Yeah. Um, and then there are other compounds that we'll be learning about that uh, other anaerobes are able to produce as a result of this mechanism, whereby again, something other than oxygen is the final electron acceptor. The other thing again to note is that the amount of ATP produced is gonna really vary significantly depending upon what bacterium we're talking about. Okay, I am going to stop here. And when we uh, get into our last lecture for chapter eight, we will talk about um, section 8.4 and um, 8.5. Remember 8.6, we are omitting. Okay, get in your book, start studying. This is not easy stuff, but try to go over it, try to get the big picture and ask questions.